The next stage up of the herbivores, plants increase herbivores, herbivores reduce plants. The next stage beyond that are the primary consumers. They, they could be uh, predators of the herbivores. Beyond, uh, in, the, in a, a pond, these are usually very small crustaceans. Next layer up are bigger crustaceans, and beyond that, fish. In other habitats, you'll have small predators like mink, foxes, ferrets, and then big predators like coyotes, uh, wolves. So this gives you different levels. At each level, the energy captured by one species is transferred to the next. And the amount of transfer depends on the nature of our physiology and metabolism. It's usually about 10%. So 10% of the vegetation that we eat can be transformed into us. 10% of what a grazing animal eats gets transformed into cow. But now 10% of the cow gets transformed into lion. So that's only 1% of the vegetation. So the answer to the question, how many layers are there in a food chain, is a question of how much food is available to support the top. And this depends on the productivity, the abundance of the habitat. So a habitat which is sparse will be able to have only very few layers. You may have, for instance, a place that only has vegetation and consumers of vegetation. Predators require sufficient abundance, and this usually means covering a large area, depending on their size, of course. But a mountain lion in the Pacific Mountains requires something on the order of 100 square miles. So they'll have a very large home range and a small population size. With a small population size, they usually don't associate much with each other. Bears are notorious for being antisocial. A mother bear will stay with the cub for something like three years, and then it's on its own. So that's part of the answer to the question, why doesn't the food chain go on up indefinitely? The answer is that at each level, there's a reduction in the amount of energy available. At least that's, that's one answer. So now you ask about parasites. What species have more parasites? And it would have to be the ones that are more abundant. So there are no diseases that I know of that are unique to bears. In the zoo, Bears suffer from the same respiratory diseases of other mammals. And if you thought about it, you'd see that there couldn't, there couldn't easily be a disease just of bears, because the bears aren't in that much contact with each other. But if there were, what would the characteristics of that disease be? Since bears meet very infrequently, it would have to be a disease that lasts a long time. It have multiple opportunities for transfer. Not only does it last a long time, but during that time, its host has to be in good enough physical condition to do whatever interactions take place. <coughs> so Yanis Antonovich put forth a hypothesis Sexually transmitted diseases are milder than vector-borne disease. Because in order to maintain itself in a population, it has to be able to reproduce in the host, keep the host alive, 
keep the host sexually active and have a mechanism of transfer. Now, because it's in the host a long time, it's living in a dangerous habitat. And so these long-term parasites have evolved mechanisms for defending themselves. And this might involve either hiding from the immune system or destroying it. It also has to juggle the question of how can it transfer to another individual? Well, Antonovich tested his hypothesis going through all the reports of vector-borne and sexually transmitted diseases in all the animal species and even in plant species that were listed. In plant species, a sexual disease would be one of the seed and the pollen. He found that this was true, that the vector-borne diseases tend to be milder. They tend to develop quickly, kill the host quickly, but meanwhile have gotten to another host. <coughs> there are things, obviously, that fit in neither category. And one of the things that they can do is last in the external environment for very long periods of time. You have things like tetanus and anthrax. So there, now there are these different strategies to cope with the problem that in order to be happy, a parasite needs a good source of food, safety from the body's defenses, and a satisfactory exit to another host. Now sometimes these characteristics may conflict with each other. Um, the central nervous system would be a good place to hide out, but it doesn't have an exit. It's rich in nutrition, relatively safe from the body's defenses, but you can't get away. So some parasites reach compromises and they'll hang out in the liver until it's time to reproduce, then they go out into the blood and can get picked up and transferred. Or cerebral malaria is a dead end. That once it gets into the brain, it does harm to people, but it doesn't get from the brain into mosquitoes or into any other host. Consider then another another kind of competitive, of adaptive problem, and that is the, di the diarrhea. From the point of view of the parasite, the symptoms of diarrhea are the mechanism for finding another host. Okay? Um, from the point of view of the parasite, or rather from the point of view of the host, it's the duration of the infection and the severity of symptoms. So you ask, how would natural selection act on the parasite? Now there are two things that are being traded. If it stays within the host, it could reproduce. It's found a habitat, habitat which is already acceptable to it. Uh, on the other hand, it's not getting anywhere. So if it produces more severe symptoms, it'll get out into the environment perhaps find another host, but it's had less time to reproduce. So there's a trade-off between reproductive rate in the host and escape through producing nasty symptoms into the next host. Again, different gastrointestinal microorganisms will have different strategies. There are fast ones and slow ones. But this can change. Suppose now that people start intervening with antibiotics. The antibiotic is making the host habitat less suitable relatively quickly. This means that from the point of view of the parasite now, it might be a good idea to reproduce like crazy, produce symptoms as severe as it can, because the severe symptoms for a gastrointestinal infection uh, represent a lot of reproduction. So 
you reproduce a lot, produce severe symptoms, and get out with the diarrheic symptoms. So the evolution then, in response to antibiotics, may be of that kind. Or consider the question of digging latrines in a developing country. In my neighborhood in Puerto Rico, the latrines were in the schools. The, the schools also served lunch, which meant that it had a water tank for cooking and drinking. The problem was that during the rainy season, the latrine overflowed and contaminated the water tank. So and at the end of the rainy season, it'd be the annual ritual of deworming the children. These are particularly ralworms that were important, but also bacterial infections. Okay. Uh, so the introduction of the latrine and the school made it possible for easier transfer. And so we have worms which lasts for a relatively long time, waiting their opportunity, and the opportunity will arise. For the roundworm, well, they have different pathways, but Ascaris, which was the most common roundworm where I was, uh, leaves the eggs in the soil and, or in the water, and so you didn't have a fecal-oral transmission route. Now, Ascaris, like other roundworms, does not reproduce in the host. The worm matures and releases eggs. So our problem in control is getting rid of the eggs, preventing their ingestion. There are other roundworms that use different pathways of transmission, like the hookworm. In the case of the hookworm, the entry is through bare feet. And so a major part of a campaign against hookworm is the distribution of shoes to school children. The important thing in this analysis is that everything we do changes the conditions of natural selection for our parasites. That therefore the relationship between ourselves and the parasite is constantly changing. You cannot use a textbook which says, this is the life cycle of the roundworm, and then expect that when you invent a way of interrupting that life cycle, you've controlled the roundworm. The life cycles are evolving. People are very good hosts because we're abundant and we're physically of large size, so we can support enormous populations. We also share diseases with other species. And the question that arises here is, what other species might we be sharing parasites with? Well, first of all, there has to be contact. Um, do they have to be similar? The work with plant disease shows that the, vector of, the major vectors of plant disease will infect plants of not only different species, but even of different plant families. And that the important thing from the point of view of the aphid is getting from one to another, the right seasonality. So for instance, the wheat rust is a disease not only of wheat, but also of the wild barberry. And so the first campaigns to control wheat rust were cam campaigns to wipe out the barberry. These are certainly unrelated. The wheat harvest ends the wheat rust dies out, the survivors are on the Barbary, and some of these are growing in Mexico. At the beginning of the spring, the winds start carrying them, and it takes about three or four weeks for the wheat rust to get from Mexico to Canada. We, the rusts are a particularly interesting group of fungus in that they don't live in the soil. They go directly from plant to plant. And so that's a different situation from the soil-borne diseases, the potato blight, 
the tomato blight and so on. Now you also have pests, which are both vectors of disease and pests on their own. That is, they, they transmit disease, but they also devour the host. And this is true of some of the nematodes that bite into a plant's roots, and they also inoculate bacteria. The bacteria reproduce, and the nematode is really feasting on the bacteria, but it's also damaging the, the roots of the plants. So uh, what I want to give you here is a sense that in ecological communities, multiple species occupy different places in the food, food chain or food web. But they're also evolving. And in historical times, there have been the spread of pests and the spread of diseases from one host to another. These zoonoses, developed mostly in the old world as diseases of cattle and then they spread to people, things like tuberculosis. But I think I already pointed out that not all diseases of animals spread to people. There have to be certain kinds of similarities. One kind of similarity is body temperature. And so we share relatively few diseases with reptiles, since they don't maintain body temperature. Among the exceptions are grass-eating reptiles who develop a body temperature, higher temperature in the gut. These will tend to be the bigger reptiles, things like lizards, the iguana lizard. The iguana is about so big, um, they'll eat grass and then they'll sit down somewhere to digest. A lot of dinosaurs probably did this. But for the most part, amphibians and reptiles are sufficiently cold-blooded so that they, they don't produce an environment that's especially conducive to infection. On the other hand, Streptococcus has its greatest number of species in reptiles. So that refutes the original hypothesis. And that leads to the suggestion that all of our cleverest ideas at best work somewhere. And there'll be places where they don't work at all. So therefore, it's important in doing any kind of theoretical work to get a good idea. Good ideas are important. And then to ask the question, when will it not work? Either when will it not work now, or when will the beast evolve some way of getting around it? And if that's the case, what ways do we have of getting around it? Now, the age of antibiotics has been relatively short. At the present time, there are almost no new antibiotics in the pipeline. It's not profitable. So we ask the question, let's say 100 years generously is an age of antibiotics, during which time the par uh, parasites uh, evolve resistance to the antibiotics. By the way, there's a nomenclatural con uh, confusion sometimes. From the point of view of the medical profession, a parasite is a multicellular invader, usually a worm. From the point of view of ecology, a parasite is an organism which makes a living by eating another one gradually, as against a predator which will eat its host in one gulp. The parasite uh, infects, lays its eggs in the host. Uh, so that I may sometimes, yeah. So bacteria, virus, and ecology all are referred to as parasites? Yes. And not just the parasite. That's right. When we talk about parasitism, as an evolutionary phenomenon, it would include those. And it includes the protozoans and so forth. So we have a food chain in which there are a number of different layers, uh, depending upon the ability of energy transfer. Uh, 
There is the adaptation sideways to new hosts. The development of agriculture was one of, one of the major pathways. <coughs> and that allows the invasion of those parasites who have hosts, which provide similar habitats. So uh, the respiratory system is a good one. The next thing is that the food chain is a bit too stylized. There are some things about the food chain that are important. And one of the most important ones is bioconcentration. Uh, if an alga picks up some toxic chemicals, some pesticide in the water, and then it's eaten by a crustacean, a crustacean has eaten 100 alga, and a lot of that pesticide simply stays there. So then a bigger crustacean comes along, eats that, and so on. So the higher up the food chain, the greater the concentration of toxic materials. That's one general rule. Another is the more you're exposed to a toxin, the more you'll pick up. Young fish are more exposed to toxins in the water because their, their gulls move more rapidly. The gills, rather. And it's the, the number of gill movements which determines how much water is passing through the fish and therefore the amount of exposure. So young fish, uh, fish which are high up in the food chain, so there'll be differences among the fish that nutritionists have been trying to educate a public about. You have less of that on land, where the layers in the food chain are more clear cut, and where we tend to eat low down in the first two layers, feeding on plant life and herbivores. And there are a few cases where we feed on detritivores, things which feed on the decaying matter. And that's essentially the mushrooms. So we can feed on mushrooms. Uh, but for the most part, our lives depend on eating plant matter. And then secondly, on eating the herbivores. There's relatively little eating of predators. And in fact, I think that the biblical injunctions in Leviticus and Deuteronomy exclude the eating of predators by some criteria that you apply to the hooves. That they have to have a split hoof and they have to have the kind of digestive system, um, multiple digestion, choose the cud. That creates an intestinal environment which is quite different from our own. And that uh, creates a kind of barrier against the uh, uh, against the transfer of infections from cattle to people. Now there will be exceptions to this. You can, for instance, chapter eleven of Leviticus says that you can eat beetles and locusts, and I presume that this is related to the phenomenon of enormous invasions of these insects. Beetles, grasshoppers, and locusts come in such swarms they devour the crops so there's nothing else to eat. Uh, there are also other schools of interpretation of the uh, religious prohibitions in dietary law. And aside from the hygienic element, there's the question of the abundance of the animal as food. And the third explanation is that it's arbitrary and that's just the point of it. That the point of religious prohibitions is to have something arbitrary so you always have to think about it and they ask, uh, why don't we eat this? Because it's prohibited. To, uh, rituals are that way. These are activities that are not directly promoting the physical well-being of an organism but are carried out perhaps 
to promote the cohesion of the community. Okay, so we've had the food chain in a qualitative kind of way. And when things cut across, for instance, the same animal might eat a predator and an herbivore. This happens in the ocean much more because filter feeders filter anything that's there in the water the right size. Um, so then the food chain becomes a web. And then you have to start asking the question, if your concern is a particular section of the food chain, you always have to ask, where does the rest of nature enter? No model is ever complete. But models are okay. That second equation is good for introducing the idea that there's a limited carrying capacity and that the initial rate of growth of a population is not the same as the growth that it levels are at. So we can talk about R species and K species, referring to whether they're colonists that grow rapidly and then move on, or slow growers that establish themselves and stay and reach high levels of population. So the intellectual constructs that we make in the model building are both helpful and insightful and also wrong. And it's this wrongness which is important in our appreciation of science. That science has two faces, a growing insight into the world, both, uh, both natural and social, and a growing uh, obscuring where the models are misleading because they make assumptions that seem plausible but don't actually hold in some other circumstances. And sometimes these other circumstances are, are very specialized. You can get around them. At other times, they're so common that we have to really drastically change the model. And so, if you read journals like the American Naturalist over the last 40 years, what you'll see is uh, that second equation is the logistic equation with a lock of Voltaire equation sometimes. And so you'll see papers saying, what happens to the lock of Voltaire equation when the parameters are varying? Or, what happens if there's a delay in the system? And so a predator doesn't eat the prey that have just reproduced, but the ones that were reproducing five years ago. Um, what happens if a predator only feeds when its other prey are missing? What happens if it feeds only on the young? Um, so one of the tasks of the ecologist. Oh, then, then people introduce space. What happens in a landscape where some habitats are suitable and other habitats are not suitable? And so one of the things that I got into early was the structure of habitat. It's pattern in space and time, as that affects the interactions between species and the course of natural selection. So what we try to teach is a combination of confidence and skepticism. There are those students who encounter the fallibility of science as a trauma. And then they'll say that science is no good, it's just a pack of lies corresponding to the whims of the scientists. And if they go down that path, they'll abandon science and switch to the business school. <laughs> Another way is to say that unlike the humanities, science is the true path to knowledge. And you learn how to estimate parameters, and you set up models, and you believe them. And so you get to conclusions which hold only in very special cases. And what I'm looking for is the kind of stance that sees the relativity but the 